Thank you very much. Um, it is in, indeed a, a great honor uh, to be uh, invited to European Network of Japanese Philosophy. And, and I give them an opportunity to uh, uh, make a presentation uh, in this uh, sixth uh, annual uh, conference. Unfortunately, I cannot uh, travel from the, the uh, United States to Hungary this time um, um, because of the, the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, which uh, doesn't allow me to uh, go out and then come back to the United States uh, without a lot of problems. So, um, uh, so um, um, I decided to uh, rely upon uh, Zoom for this uh, presentation. Um, of course, first of all, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to the organizers of this conference, and then uh, particularly uh, Professor Tako, who really helped me uh, throughout the, the um, last year, and then and, and even before, uh, and then I uh, decided to uh, participate in, in this uh, organization, uh, even though I have never been present uh, the conferences uh, for uh, the European Network of uh, Japanese uh, Philosophy. Um, I will try my best to uh, confine sort of my presentation within a given time, but I may have to uh, 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 skip certain parts of the uh, discussion. So uh, uh, we'll see how I can, uh, you know, um, uh, follow the argumentation I, I prepared. So let me start about area studies. And then I understand many of the, the uh, people present or uh, participating in this uh, gathering are familiar with uh, area studies, idea of area studies in uh, the United States. Um, area studies designates a disciplinary formation that was institutionalized at a higher education level in the United States of America in the late 1940s after the end of Second World War. The very idea of area studies was put forth in order to supplement the forthcoming international order, which nowadays we summarily called Pax Americana. Already during World War II, the lack of a system of colonial imperial knowledge by means of which to manage the relationship between United States and other foreign and exotic regions such as Japan, China, Southeast Asia, Central and South America was keenly felt. By the end of the uh, World War II, it was evident that United States would be the only superpower capable of dominating the rest of the world in the post-World War II world. And of course, Soviet Union was another superpower at that time, but I do not think economically and, and resources, uh, in, in terms of resources, the you know, uh, Soviet Union could, could uh, uh, dominate the, the entire world. Although actually uh, uh, during the Cold War, uh, Soviet Union uh, created their own uh, sort of sphere of influence. 
unlike old imperial powers such as Britain, France, Netherlands, and Japan, however, the United States did not have an established regime of intelligence and research to help to sustain America's uh, colonial and imperial operations on a global scale. Introduction of the disciplinary formation of area studies drastically changed the character of the United States in the international world. But it is also important to remember that it served to transform American society in such a way that United States university education was radically converted into a new model for other countries to emulate. In so many ways, the disciplinary formation of area studies uh, uh, symbolized this new status of the United States in uh, of the post-World War II international world as a sole dominant colonial uh, power even during the Cold War. Uh, next, please. In this respect, the term area studies symbolically represented the new international order of Pax Americana promoted by the United States of America. Of course, it was implied that old systems of colonialism had proven uh, uh, to be uh, neither effectual nor legitimate. Hence, Area studies is often noted for its post-colonial character. But we have to, to be careful about this uh, word, post-colonial char uh, 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 character. It is imperative, however, to underline this ambiguous word, post-coloniality, since even though the word carries the prefix post, it should not be taken to mean what comes after colonialism at all, because colonialism remained. And in a sense, because of this strange use of post-coloniality, I think in the 1980s and the 90s, uh, so-called post-colonial studies uh, flourished. After uh, Second World War, United States attempted to resurrect the system of international law, but with major alterations. It was often claimed that the United States was opposed to the old system of international law that sanctioned modern colonialism and opposed to the system according to which world was divided into two regions. That is, one uh, side is called Europe, where people and land were to be regulated by the system of international law. Therefore, I think international law originally was called a uh, European uh, public law, with each state claiming to have its own sovereignty, clearly defined territory and population, and while the other was uh, often referred to as non-Europe or the rest of the world, where territories and peoples were deprived of their territorial sovereignties and were vulnerable to colonial uh, violence. Under the old system of international law, Overwhelming portion of the world outside Europe, uh, strictly speaking, Europe meant, uh, I think, Western Europe, while Eastern Europe, along with certain po um, portions of Western Europe, were not included in the international world. Um, a certain portion of uh, Western port, uh, Europe, for example, Ireland, uh, until uh, early uh, 20th century was not really in, in, in included as an independent uh, uh, 
uh, uh, sovereign state. So um, as a result, the many parts of the rest of the world were eventually conquered and colonized. So in this sense, old international law, uh, uh, in a sense, justified and then sustained the uh, modern uh, colonialism. Next, please. At the end of World War II, the United States decided to abolish this bifurcation of the world and introduced revised system of international law, according to which peoples and large surface outside the West, um, I have to use the term West here instead of Europe because uh, Europe was gradually replaced by the new label of the West in the uh, early 20th century. And, and, and these uh, uh, land surfaces and people uh, outside the West were also entitled to their sovereignty and territory. Thus, the term post-colonial was promoted to characterize the new international order launched by the United States as if it had been the agent of anti-colonialism. Area studies played an important role in this propagandist use of the word post-colonial. Nevertheless, the colonial imperial order of the modern world, the bifurcation of the West and the rest actually remained intact to a large extent under the new arrangement of Americas. Professor, uh, can you can you hear me? I'm sorry, but uh, your your microphone is is muted. Could you please, could you please unmute? Off now. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I don't know. It's switched off. Um, area studies contributed much to this uh, set of arrangements, and in this respect, this this disciplinary formation of knowledge did not contradict the colonial imperial order of the modern world at all. Through a variety of channels in foreign countries designated as areas, area experts participated in the intelligence gathering, interfered with political decision-making pro process, and then assessed economic political strategy for the United States and its allies. Just like the old colonial administrators in the colonies, area experts operated secretly to promote American interest in these foreign settings. But perhaps what is most important is the role area studies played in the identity politics of the United States as well as the West at large in the sustenance of colonial imperial order of the modern world. Initially, when the very idea of area studies was proposed at the Social Science Research Council in the late 1940s, indeed, North America was not included among geographic regions designated as areas. North America was a place for the subject of area studies, where agents of studies and research on the area were located. Origin, uh, uh, that's the area uh, where the agents of study were originally originated. It was not 
an object that area experts were expected to study. Uh, next, please. But interesting enough, in the original proposal, uh, Western Europe was lined up as one of the areas. Despite the American rhetoric of anti-colonialism, it was not expected that as far as area studies was concerned, all the conventional bifurcation of the modern world into two contrasting positionalities to borrow the, the, the vocabulary of uh, Stuart Hall, uh, that contrasting personality uh, usually called the West and the rest, where the West represented subject of knowing while the rest was designated exclusively as the object of knowing and was to be rejected. Uh, this arrangement was rejected by design uh, it was not implied that way. In the subsequent de development of the academic disciplines of area studies at American universities, however, not a single area studies program was built in which Western Europe was actually registered as the area. From the late 1940s through the 1980s, in any studies program at American University, Western Europe was never treated as an area at all. Hence, even today, United States, uh, including uh, Canada, I mean North America, uh, uh, including Canada, but not uh, Mexico, and Western Europe are excluded from areas. In other words, the concept of the area has continued to mark the rest of the world, a territory and population distinct from and studied by the West. Even today, disciplines of area studies serve to endorse the anthropological difference between the West and the rest. Uh, next, please. Okay, and then uh, again, next, please. The term post-colonial, which was supposed to mark the newness of area studies, in fact, continued to endorse the underlying conviction of colonial imperial order of the modern world, namely that European humanity ought to be inherently and traditionally distinct from the rest of the humanity. It is in this particular sense the disciplinary formation of area studies has served to sustain institutional desire for anthropological difference. I will uh, I'll go back to the uh, term anthropological uh, uh, difference uh, later, and then and I, I uh, want to uh, later explain the uh, conception of uh, anthropological difference and how it is used. It is in this particular sense that the disciplinary formation of area studies has ser um, served to sustain institutional desire for anthropological difference. This is to say, the form of knowledge production concretized in area studies in nothing but a desire or prescriptive uh, anticipation that uh, uh, European humanity that now constituted the majority population in North America in 19, uh, late 1940s and uh, uh, 1950s, at that point, 
ought to be distinct from the rest of humanity. That is to say, the West included, of course, Western Europe and now the, the uh, large portion of North America as well. Discipline of area studies introduced new disciplinary arrangement, generally termed interdisciplinarity, and it transformed the fields of humanities and social sciences. Towards the end of the 20th century, thanks to their popularity, an increasing number of universities, first in East Asia and later in Europe and other places, adopted this disciplinary model. So uh, uh, you find uh, many programs uh, uh, emerging uh, in East Asia and, and, and Europe uh, that called themselves area studies. Furthermore, since the 1990s, an increasing number of students from these countries, such as India and, and China, uh, classified as area, have enrolled in area studies programs at American universities. In other words, the flow of students from areas in Asia and Latin America gave rise to a confusion and irregularity at the heart of this disciplinary formation. Students from China and India, for example, were supposed to be objects of knowing to play the role of indigenous people to be studied rather than to act as a subject of knowing in area studies. Initially, those foreign and non-European students were treated as if their contribution to their academic scholar was only as native informants. However, some outstanding students from such backgrounds have begun to undermine some of the rules that covertly endorse the anthropological difference between the West and the rest. Included among them are such people as, uh, you are familiar with these names, uh, Edward Said, Beatrice Fibert, Homi Baba, Rachel, and so forth, even though Strictly speaking, it had been in the field of comparative literature rather than area studies that these scholars have been allowed to manifest their talents. What is at stake is the very idea of European humanity, which has played such a significant role in the development of humanities and social sciences in modern world. Of course, the problem of theory and by extension of philosophical rationality has had a lot to do with the postulation of European humanity, even though the topic of European humanity in relation to theory has been carefully avoided in the field of area studies. Not to mention the topic of theory in general is, well, frankly speaking, rather unpopular uh, there. What we can observe today is a crisis of area studies. This in turn indicates the crisis of modern bifurcation of the world between the West and the rest. It is indeed a crisis of disciplinary formation involving humanistic and social sciences. But it also marks an opportunity to reconsider and reevaluate the status of theory uh, philosophy in the humanities. Can we continue to take for granted that as far as humanistic sciences are concerned, theory means Western theory, and that philosophy is nothing but Western philosophy. Now, 
um, allow me to focus on the particular development of area studies after Second World War. I will discuss one particular field of area studies that on Japan. Area studies under the rubric of which so-called Japanese studies is conventionally subsumed nowadays belongs to the relatively recent past in Japan. As I uh, already noted, display program area studies itself was institutionalized in higher education uh, after uh, Second World War in the United States. Since the United States and Japan were engaged in Pacific War, many American policymakers already recognized the need for apparatus of education and intelligence gathering concerning Japan during uh, the war. It was absolutely necessary to create a system by which to teach young soldiers and nurture expert knowledge about Japan in order to effectively and successfully engage in war against Japan. In a number of respects, the study of Japan served as a prototype of area studies in general after the period of allied occupation of Japan from 1945 through to 1952. improve uh, sort of the imperative for transformation of the Japanese population into uh, a modern nation. Oh, sorry, I skipped, uh, uh, sorry. And uh, please, uh, uh, next uh, slide, please. But in academic, academia in Japan, the term Japanese studies is comparatively recent uh, invention. Historically, a group of diverse disciplines focusing on the Japanese, uh, Japanese literature, history, ethnology preceded it. But in contrast, uh, these or their equivalents did not exist as Amer uh, academic disciplines in American higher education before the war. In Japanese academia, diverse national and humanistic and social scientific, in some cases, uh, disciplines that focus on Japan were being integrated into one large program of area studies, uh, actually in the 1990s, uh, and then uh, it's an uh, ongoing process uh, today. And probably uh, this transition towards area studies is most glaringly marked uh, by the 1987 inauguration of the International Research Center for Japanese Studies in Kyoto. A long time before this era of globalization, old uh, national studies of Japan were created in the late 19th century in the process of Japan's entry into modern international world. The introduction of such disciplines as Japanese literature, Kokubungaku, Japanese history, Kokushi, Japanese linguistic, Nihongaku, or in some cases, Kokugoaku, and the Japanese ethnology, Minzokunaku, was an integral part of the establishment of the system of universal uh, national education and academia. Modern universities were introduced in Japan for the first time, uh, um, uh, mainly after the uh, major restoration, uh, as well as during the Meiji period, as an essential component of uh, Japanese modernization. National disciplines in the humanities and social science were viewed as absolutely uh, imperative 
for the transformation of the Japanese uh, population into modern nation. And these uh, national uh, disciplines continued to be transformed and as the circumstances changed until the end of the Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific War, but they were free established and integrated into the system of the uni uni um, universal national education and higher education in the Japanese empire, which included annexed territories such as Korea and Taiwan. There are a few significant characteristics to be noted in the initial formation of modern discipline in the humanities. Generally speaking, national languages such as uh, English, German, French, and Japanese were taught at university level. This principle of national language did not apply to social sciences, even though what language, uh, for instance, the uh, United Kingdom, France, Germany were countries to which young scholars were often sent for professional training. Each social science scientist was trained in and was a significant factor. So some social science are uh, good at German, while others were uh, uh, good at English and so forth. But social science was not divided according to uh, national languages. But humanities were classified in this way. First of all, national literature of European colonial power was acknowledged as something for the Japanese to emulate. Hence, English literature department, French literature department, and the German literature department were uh, introduced. But interestingly enough, enough uh, Chinese studies uh, uh, department existed yet in Chinese studies de um, uh, uh, department. Uh, actually, modern China was not studied until uh, 1930s. Uh, I think uh, Takeo Joshimi, a uh, very well-known sinologist, once uh, commented and criticized the status of Chinese studies in, at uh, Japanese, uh, uh, Japanese universities. And interesting enough, this modern humanistic formation uh, included the discipline of philosophy itself. The modern humanistic sciences were established in Japan within the purview of discourse of the West and the rest. In this sense, very interestingly, a uh, word tetsugaku, uh, Japanese word tetsugaku, uh, uh, meaning philosophy, itself is a neologism. It didn't exist uh, uh, prior to uh, uh, modernization of Japan. And since the Meiji Restoration, many attempts have been made to assert something like philosophical uh, uh, argument uh, existed in the Japanese archipelago, but an academic discipline, the field of Japan's national philosophy has never existed. Such germs of academic study modified by the word philosophy as Indian philosophy and Chinese philosophy existed. But it was not agreed that despite word philosophy, they could uh, uh, not belong to the discipline of philosophy itself. These topics were taught in the de Department of Ethnology or 
others such as Indian or Chinese studies or Indian or Chinese history. I have not conducted any substantial research, so I cannot be too confident on this point, but I am reasonably certain that there is no philosophy department in the United States where uh, one can outright study Indian or Chinese philosophy. Usually in the Department of Philosophy, modern European languages and classical uh, Greek and Latin are accepted as a media of teaching and research. But Asian or African languages are not registered as the official media of department curriculum. Of course, it has been in implicit assumption since the late 19th century that students enrolled in courses registered in the department philosophy are capable, capable of reading, writing, conversing in the modern Japanese language. So the, the, the modern Japanese language uh, became a, a basic condition in which I think the, uh, the study uh, uh, was conducted. And uh, interesting enough, the four uh, early Japanese modern philosophers uh, like uh, Nishida Kitaro, when Nishida actually uh, reminisced early uh, days of his, uh, uh, his uh, 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 studies that writing philosophy in the Japanese language itself was something very, very revolutionary. And the, for the first time, uh, philosophical discussion was introduced in the medium of Japanese language. And of course, uh, those students were expected to study European languages and uh, in some cases, uh, European classical languages, uh, Greek and, and Latin. But um, uh, most basic is that knowledge of European languages and uh, Japanese uh, language, modern Japanese language. And of course, this is a very important marker of Japan's modernization. That is probably for the first time. Uh, Japanese language itself was, in a sense, standardized uh, uh, national uh, language of Japan was created and it was a sign of uh, modernization. So um, just briefly uh, explain the background against which uh, I'm going to uh, discuss the works by uh, uh, Watsuji Tetsuo. And then uh, and, uh, also uh, I would like to uh, touch upon a bit about uh, Edmund Husserl because Husserl was uh, very much concerned about the status of philosophy. And then also he is the one who openly discussed the crisis of uh, European humanity. So first of all, in relation to Japanese uh, philosophy institution or uh, institution of philosophy uh, in Japanese education, uh, let me briefly introduce uh, Watsuji uh, Tetsuo. Uh, it is no coincidence that intellectual work of Watsuji Tetsuo, perhaps the most popular philosopher of Japan uh, among area experts, is usually classified in the field of ethics. Uh, or ethical thought uh, 
Japanese intellectual uh, history or Japanese cultural history. As a matter of fact, after returning to the University of Tokyo from Kyoto University, Watsuji taught as a professor of ethics, not professor of philosophy. Interesting enough, Japanese intellectual history has rarely been included in the curriculum of the philosophy department. In order to elucidate the status of Japanese philosophy, national philosophy by implication. With regard to the disciplinary genre of philosophy at large, we must consider two initial uh, questions. First, philosophy was regarded perhaps until the late 20th century as the core discipline among the humanities. It has been nationalized in specific ways in Europe, I'm talking about, and, and uh, as the education of national population became regulated by the idea of the national and universal language in modern times. As a result, a uh, uh, modern uh, period is marked by uh, increasing tendency to conduct uh, philosophy in the medium of national language. Interesting from the, uh, increasingly from the 17th and 18th centuries, philosophy constituted itself as a humanistic discipline conducted in the national languages in Europe, French in France, English in the United Kingdom, German in Germany, and so forth. It did not necessarily imply that the topic to be discussed in philosophy were limited to those taken from the national history, but language in the media of which philosophy was taught had to be the national language of the nation state and the humanities departments were expected to contribute to the nationalization of the population. That's a characteristic of uh, modern university in general. And of course, emergence of national language itself is one of the most uh, important markers of uh, European modernity. How should we understand the new relation encouraged in Japan between the national language and discipline of philosophy? Second question, Indian or Chinese philosophy was not included in the curriculum of the philosophy department. In other words, it was presumed that philosophy originated and had been developed in Europe or the West. And that essentially any intellectual tradition born or developed outside Europe or the West could not be regarded as belonging to the discipline of philosophy. In short, philosophy was from the out, uh, onset Western philosophy. Even if this field of humanistic inquiry was not specifically modified the adjective of European or Western, it was inherently a form of rationality that could be found only in Europe or the West. In other words, philosophy was destined to be a spiritual shape of European humanity, to borrow Edmund Husserl's expression. It was a manifestation of a theoretical attitude that belonged exclusively to Europeans. Therefore, philosophy and theory were often almost interchangeable then how do we deal with Japanese philosophy in this regard? Is it not an oxymoron from the outset? Okay, um, we have uh, already uh, uh, passed the half of the time 
uh, given to me. So let me skip uh, uh, some portions. So uh, next, uh, please, next slide, please. I do not argue there are many issues about which the two authors, Husserl and then Watsuchi, agree with each other on, even though both were engaged in the discipline of philosophy. That is not the point. However, there is one topic on which the authors supplemented one another. In a peculiar way, here we, they seem to form a mutually complementary relationship. This topic is the presumption of anthropological difference. A sort of prescriptive anticipation Prescriptive anticipation meaning it's not factual. It's not already uh, uh, fait accompli in the present, but it's something that is expected to happen in the future. That insists that European humanity is inherently and historically distinct from the rest of humanity. And anthropological difference is closely affiliated with general theme of theory and theoretical attitude that marks the tradition of philosophy in Europe. If, if not completely oxymoronic, pairing of theory and Asia, as in Asian theory, for instance, may strike many readers as a sort of quirk or a defamiliarizing uh, trick, if not an, an, uh, uh, as an exoticizing curiosity like Zen theory. At best, it can have the effect of exposing the presumption often assumed in academic fields in dealing with some aspects of what we understand in the term Asia. Namely, that theory is something we normally do not expect in Asia. Precisely because this sense of oddity involved when theory is associated with the idea is no more than certain presumption or co conditional reflex. Neither theory nor easier receive uh, uh, rigorous scrutiny. Both remain mostly vague in conceptual articulation in this instance. So we don't uh, uh, inquire into this sense of oddity involved by Asian theory. So why do we feel odd about unexpected combination of theory and Asia in the first place? Or with more of an emphasis on our analytical attentiveness, how can we manage to evade a sense of oddity about the fact that we are accustomed to feeling strange about combination of theory and easier. It must be said that there have been some attempts to explicate why theory and Asia do not go hand in hand. Quite few writers have attempted to offer some reasons or justification for Although since the end of Second World War, only a comparatively few openly conservative or reactionary thinkers have dared to justify why Asian or non-Europeans are disqualified from speaking or conceptualizing theoretically. Uh, next slide, please. In the early 20th 
Uh, oh, sorry, uh, the previous slide is good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 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 previous, yes, thank you. In the early 20th century, a number of prominent intellectuals addressed the question of Europe's commitment to theory. Immediately, Paul Barelli, a French poet, and Edmund Husserl come to mind. There are many uh, others. For example, Husserl argued that Indian or Chinese uh, uh, philosophy could hardly be regarded as authentically philosophical because life attitude that Indian and Chinese philosophers embody was not genuinely uh, theoretical. For him, Europe was not merely a geographic category, unlike empirical anthropological type, that's the term he used, such as the Chinese Indian Eskimo or even the gypsies roaming territorial Europe. Europe is a historical unity of people, he argued, sharing a certain kinship or modality of being human, a, hu a European humanity, distinguish, uh, distinguishing them from humanity in general. And it is absolutely impossible to conceive of this European man without commitment theory, which had been uh, handed down from ancient Greeks through to the 20th century in the name of uh, uh, Fiosaf, in a very, very interesting way. And there is a parallelism between uh, Husserl and, and Watsuji. But Husserl, for instance, takes for granted the continuity of European civilization from uh, Greek antiquity down to the present. Likewise, as we, we will see, uh, Watsuji uh, takes for granted the continuity of Japanese nation from antiquity to down to the present. And then, of course, uh, uh, in many ways, and I think uh, Husserl was, uncritica was uncritically uh, adopting uh, some of the uh, uh, thesis about European civilization uh, from mainly, I think, uh, romantics. So, in other words, uh, he wanted to discuss uh, European crisis of European humanities and European sciences in general, but it was closely tied with the um, crisis of European uh, humanities. In other words, he was horrified that Europeans were getting less and less spiritually distinguishable from such anthropological tribes as the Chinese and the Indians. To my knowledge, statement that we normally do not expect theory from Asia has been put forth on a number of occasions and some people have wanted to raise this issue as part of their political assessment of the contemporary world. What, for Husserl, what is significant about historic mission of humanity, European humanity, for instance, is that in his late works, notably his posthumous work uh, collected uh, and then compiled under the uh, title of the crisis of uh, European humanity, uh, European sciences and transcendental uh, phenomenology, the entire venture of his phenomenology was reformulated as a historical movement of European spirit as a theological, uh, teleological project, which is 
at the same time a recourse to the past origin of European humanity on one hand, as well as an infinite ecstatic, that is to say, going beyond oneself, uh, self-overcoming in the future on the other. Clearly, just before his death and under extreme political adversity, Husserl wanted to present his phenomenology as a historical embodiment of the mission for European humanity. He attempted to speak as the ultimate representative of the spiritual shape of Europe. This is the term he coined, spiritual shape of Europe. Let me offer a brief and admittedly rather sketchy historical assessment of uh, Husserl's ambiguity uh, as to the, the uh, uh, European humanities, uh, because uh, obviously under the uh, uh, national, uh, uh, social nationalist uh, government, he could have been expelled or he could have been uh, 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 rejected from the so-called Europe or uh, first from Germany and then uh, Europe itself. Yet he rather uh, uh, talks about the, the spiritual uh, mission of European humanities. And it's a very complex relationship. And then uh, today I, I have to skip this part because uh, he was uh, very much involved uh, the time, I mean, in the, in the situation in Europe at the time. And then, uh, for instance, uh, he couldn't uh, deliver a public lecture in, inside Germany so that he had to go out of Germany to, to uh, uh, Austria and, and, and uh, uh, Czechoslovakia to uh, give uh, lectures. And one of the lectures is uh, preserved under the title of uh, Vienna uh, uh, Lecture, right? uh, in which he openly discussed the mission of uh, European uh, humanity. And uh, the situation of the period is, is as such. So um, let me go to um, skip some part because I think uh, I'm running out of time. So um, uh, next uh, slide, please. One reason why I wanted to focus on what's his history is that he has probably one of the most popular Japanese figures among area experts in uh, North America, Europe and East Asia. Of course, he also used to be very popular uh, with Japanese readers. Even today, many people at least know his name, if not his publication on ethics, Japanese culture, Japanese emperor system, and pre-modern theaters in Japan. Although he often con constructed his argument within the genre of philosophy, his philosophical writings appear very accessible to a relatively large number of people in Japan who do not necessarily have expert knowledge on philosophy. And he is known for his ability to produce lucid and easy to comprehend argumentation. Already in the 1960s, Watsuji was recognized as the one of the leading historians of Japanese culture. And there are obvious reasons why he, in being well known as the most typical ideologue for Japanese cultural nationalism, was singled out for discussion of Japanese culture by Robert Bera, as you know, uh, the one of the, the most famous 
uh, uh, sociologists uh, who used to teach at Berkeley. Moreover, we cannot overlook the circumstances of the academic publishing industry that was as he was known as a popular uh, uh, public uh, intellect. He worked with uh, Iwanami Shoten, uh, Iwanami publishers from 1920s on. So he uh, uh, contributed much to the many uh, publications by Iwanami uh, Shoten, that is, uh, until recently, I think, uh, the leading uh, publishing company uh, in, in, in Japan. And many of you are uh, familiar uh, with this, with uh, UNM publications. In addition, what is his view on the uniqueness of Japanese culture was endorsed, endorsed by quite a large number of Japanese readers with a wide uh, a variety of political stances. The Institutional Foundation of US Area Studies on Japan was formulated uh, uh, during the war and the most outstanding publication of the new field of discipline was the chrysanthemum and sword by Ruth Benedict. The English original was published soon after the end of the Asia Pacific War or World War II and its Japanese translation became available a few years later. It was based upon Benedict wartime research and collaboration with the United States Department of War in which she interviewed Japanese prisoners of war and resident Japanese Americans. The book impacted not only American readers, but also many of Japanese intellectuals, including such leading scholars as Yanagida Kunio and Watsuji Tetsuro. The main topic of the book is the national character of the Japanese. So let me underline the term national character. Benedict did not hesitate to postulate what she regarded as Japanese character culture in the singular, as if Japanese national community had been constituted as a homogeneous unity and was comparable to a tribal communities, a community among the Native Americans. In this work of anthropology at distance, there is hardly any methodological or theoretical reflection as to whether or not modern national community of Japan could be posited as an equivalent to a tribal community in anthropological field work. It is indisputably upheld that we consisting, we uh, in quotation mark, consisting on the, on the one hand of the author anthropologist together with American Western reader at large, and they, in quotation mark, Japanese people who are singular object of this study on the other. Are this, uh, um, are ambiguously distinct from uh, uh, one another. Some of the epistemic presumptions I uncover in Benedict, Watsuji, and Bella may, uh, uh, may be particular traits of these individual authors, but I am not going to argue in that way. Rather, these traits are part and, and parcel of the institution of area studies. And uh, in a sense, Nihon Jinro, uh, ja uh, the discourse on the uh, Japanese uniqueness. Uh, next, please. Robert Perra's Japanese Cultural Identity, some reflection on the work of Watsuji Tetsuro, 
was published uh, in 1968, 14 years after Benedict's monumental book. The Allied occupation of Japan, which started when it was Japan was surrendered to Allied powers in 1945, ended in 1952. And essay came out one year after the first Tokyo Olympics in the midst of the high economic growth in Japan. Not surprisingly, his essay inherited many of narrative assumptions which Benedict put forth in her analysis of Japanese culture. From the outset, Vela points out, national culture of Japan is postulated as an organic unity in Watsuji's work as a whole. So Watsuji, in fact, adhere to the rhetoric of national culture from the outset. But Bella hesitates to query either over the historicity of the specific kind of cultural formation conventionally designated as national culture, or whether or not Watsuji's trans historical use of culture could ever be acceptable. What is immediately obvious is that a nation is a community whose unity is extremely unstable and that it is an organization whose identity constantly changes historically. But Bella pays no attention to the vicissitude of the unity of nation in this uh, uh, article. He, I, I think he, he would never uh, uh, have any opinion about such constancy about American nation. Uh, uh, it, it is, uh, um, of course, uh, uh, indeed um, taken for granted in his approach to American uh, society that American nation is constantly changing. Yet, as far as Japan is concerned, he does not affirm that Japan too, or Japanese nation itself, is constantly produced and reproduced and changed. In a sense, Dera welcomes Watsuji's treatment of Japanese culture as an eternal entity lasting throughout the last 26 or so centuries as a proof for Watsuji's irremediable particularism. So let me uh, go through. And what is interesting, um, I'm sorry, I don't think I can offer a uh, very uh, thorough uh, uh, analysis. Uh, so instead, uh, let me just go through the uh, Watsuji's uh, very famous work, uh, Climate and Culture, or uh, Fudo. Right. Next slide, please. Fudo, that's the Climate Culture, is perhaps the most popular publication uh, among Watsuji's. Uh, it included uh, many, uh, cha uh, some chapters on uh, so-called uh, theoretical uh, uh, meditation on the relationship between uh, climate and then uh, uh, ethics. But it was partly based on his experience during his journey to Germany. He was awarded three-year study abroad scholarship for his study in Berlin. And he was curious about the engineers. Uh, uh, on his way to Europe, he, he uh, became very curious about the engineers uh, resident whom he observed at port his ships harbored at on his way to Europe. And 
while uh, traveling, he began to actually uh, uh, send uh, his manuscript to the Iwanami uh, Shoten uh, for, for uh, publication uh, as a seri uh, serial um, articles in Shiso, and it's probably many of you know uh, the journal, monthly journal, Shiso. Uh, it's one of the very, very few uh, uh, remaining monthly journals in Japan today. So uh, what I, uh, we can observe is that his narrative is just like conventional touristic narrative depicting the scenery of a friend land he happens to visit. No description of interaction between the visitor or narrator, that is Watsuji himself, and the resident actually living there. That is to say, it's a very strange film because Watsuji continued to speak as if a tourist confined in a, a, a uh, tour bus in which he is completely insulated from the uh, passers-by on the street uh, uh, by, uh, by a thick glass of window. And he has no intention of uh, exiting, getting out of bus and then actually speak to the, the uh, passers-by. Uh, next, please. So um, let me mention what's this observation about national characters of people living under Mont... Well, he divided the type uh, he encountered on the way to Germany uh, three type, monsoon and desert and pasture or meadow uh, type, three types. And then uh, monsoon is of course the, the uh, uh, East Asia and, and, and South Asia and desert is the uh, <clears throat> uh, Middle East for instance. Uh, and then uh, uh, Past, a pasture is a uh, meadow, uh, means uh, Europe. So first he uh, talks about the people in the South Sea. So um, by South Sea, he probably meant the uh, areas around uh, Singapore, but he didn't specify the which uh, place he talked about. He said this factor helps us to understand why this factor meaning climate you observe in the South Sea, uh, why the people of South Sea have never made any appreciable cultural progress. And then uh, in the same paragraph, he said, apart from the rare occasions when huge Buddhist pagodas were built in Java and the spur of Indian culture, People of the South Sea have given birth to no cultural monument. So they became easy prey for and ready slaves of Europeans after the Renaissance. Let's see his observation. Next, he also talks about Indians. He says, the structure of resignation type in the case of Indians, it's set in the mold of a lack of historical awareness, a fullness of feeling and relaxation of willpower. Okay, uh, next please, next slide please. And then he continues to talk about Indians. Because of his receptivity and resignation or to put it another way, because it's lack of aggressive and masterful nature, Indians, in fact, prompts in us and draws out from us all our own aggressive and masterful characteristics. 
it is on such grounds that the visitor to India is made to wish impulsively that the Indian would take up his struggle for independence. In this sense, although his cotton may well glut the world market, India is receptive and resigned as ever. Witness his policy of non-resistance and passive obedience. The physical strength of Indian laborer is said to be far less even than that of Chinese and no more than a quarter or third of that of his West European counterpart. But neither this nor his distinct nature can be transformed overnight. And then uh, next slide, please. Now he talks about Chinese. The Chinese has no mind for tax burdens imposed by the state. He escapes his obligations in the matter of military service. He ignores orders and treats the law as a scrub paper. He gambles and smokes his opium. In short, he evades all state control and conducts himself at his own will. Of course, he acquiesces in any power that would be difficult to defy, but this is an outward uh, uh, acquiescence, a formal submission only. The heart remains untamed. This resignation that does not countenance submission is intimately linked with another characteristic of the Chinese, his lack of emotion. Well, <laughs> next, please. Um, these comments show how he tried to uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, expect, explicate um, the national characters of those people he encountered on his way to, to uh, uh, Europe. What he calls national character or a cultural uh, uh, character is rather untheorized because Indians at that time did not have a nation in the modern sense of the word. China didn't. As a matter of fact, the Watsuji was one of uh, the ideologues who argued that the Chinese are incapable of forming the nation itself so that uh, it was necessary for the Japanese to interfere with affairs in China to help them create uh, a nation. And in this way, he, in fact, uh, justified Japanese invasion of China. And he was one of those uh, ideologues in, in the 1930s. Apart from the projection of racist stereotypes onto peoples in the South Sea, India, and China, what one cannot uh, miss is a persistent of desire underlying these attempts to describe the national characteristics of residents of Asian port he sojourned in. That is, he speaks as though he were a British man administering these colonies. He tries to focus on the shortcomings inherent in these peoples and argues that it was not violent conquest on the part of British colonizer that enslaved those peoples. Their inherent shortcomings caused the colonization of China, Singapore, and India. Therefore, they had only themselves to blame. 
there is very interesting transference between Watsuji himself and, uh, and the British. The, the, uh, what he imagined to be the British. Right? And, and in this sense, uh, he in fact internalized the um, rhetorical strategy uh, usually uh, uh, referred to uh, that's a, a new or meaning. Uh, okay, next please. Exiting Asia and entering Europe, which was in fact uh, promoted uh, during the Meiji period by uh, uh, people uh, such as uh, Fukuzawa Yukichi. Regardless of whether Watsuji himself disliked such values and attitudes as Protestant ethics and individualism, he could not free himself from the discourse of the West and the rest. He was clearly in so many ways, anti-Western, yet he continued to operate within the discourse of the West and the rest. In his obsessive concern for the viewpoint of British, Watsuji was of course not alone. Best example by the phrase exiting Asia and entering Europe, Japan's modernization was guided by a desire to exit Asia and enter Europe. Clearly, Japanese took for granted the bifurcated spatial structure of the world between Europe and non-Europe and the West and the rest. The, let us remind ourselves once again, the hostility towards the West or individualism does not guarantee that one is outside of the discourse of the West and the rest at all. Actually, the bifurcation of the West and the rest was the basic structure uh, against which Japan's modernization was engineered. And this is no surprise, I mean, therefore there is uh, no surprise that the discipline of philosophy in Japanese university is in fact organized according to the principle of the West and the rest. As a result, it was impossible to teach not only Indian or Chinese philosophy, but also Japanese philosophy in philosophy department, because philosophy essentially meant Western philosophy. Next, please. Okay. Well, um, we have already run out of time. So um, in this, uh, my question uh, is about the relationship between Watsuji and uh, Robert Bella. Uh, Robert Bella pointed out that Watsuji was a, a representative uh, uh, figure a representative philosopher of Japanese culture, precisely because of Watsuji's particularism. Of course, uh, universalism versus particularism, this opposition uh, played a very important role in modernization theory in general. And then, uh, although he was much more critical of modernization theorists or the followers of so-called modernization, in general, because he didn't agree with their reading of uh, Max Weber. Max Weber actually was much, much more, much more critical about uh, contemporary capitalism. And in this sense, 
uh, uh, what's, uh, sorry, Bera wanted to stand much closer to Japanese Marxists uh, who also uh, try to synthesize uh, Karl Marx and uh, Max Weber, uh, people like Otsuka Hisao. And, and, and in the sense, the, uh, in a strange way, uh, he was very close to the leftist uh, intellectuals uh, in the post-war Japan. And as you probably know, uh, Robert Baer himself was a member of American Communist Party in, uh, when he was uh, still at college. And so in this sense, he was not simply endorsing uh, Watsuji, but in so many ways, Watsuji represented what Robert Bella wanted Japanese to be. Hence, he relied on Watsuji in order to explain the majority of Japanese uh, people in Japan. Although he admittedly uh, 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 referred to very small number of universalist thinkers, such as uh, Uchimura Kanzo and uh, Nishida Kitaro, and, and, and of course, uh, Fukuzai Kichi and so forth. So there is certain structure of, uh, I understand that uh, this conference uh, is uh, uh, organized under the title of counter influence or influence. Instead of influence, I might introduce the idea of transference. That is to say, the mutually opposed parties, in fact, confirm each other for what they want to see in the other. And basic structure. So that's one of the reasons for the institution of Japanese philosophy uh, in Japan already predicted what um, uh, Edmund Husserl uh, argued about the crisis of European humanity in his last uh, uh, unfinished uh, work, a Crisis of European uh, 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 Sciences and then Transcendental uh, Phenomenology in a very, very ironical way. And of course, the further question is, is it possible to deal with this structure of transferential relationship? Is it possible to transform area studies in such a way that we can no longer adhere to the discourse of the West and the rest? I'm sorry, uh, I had to rush towards the end um, because I ran out of time. But uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for this uh, for this great uh, series of, of, of thoughts, and, and thank you very much for uh, for mentioning uh, a lot of topics uh, that will be uh, that will be in the focus of uh, of the different sessions uh, of our conference. Uh, I think this was uh, this was a, a very important uh, keynote speech, also in the sense of opening. Uh, our event uh, and our joint thinking about uh, influences and counter influences uh, and uh, transferences, as uh, as you said, uh, due to the uh, to the limited time we have, I would suggest that we uh, that we uh, have one question from the audience. Uh, so I ask uh, whether someone in the room uh, would like to would like to ask. 
the professor, and of course, I'm I'm also asking uh, those joining online uh, whether whether there are questions to the professor. Here in the room, it would uh, it would mean coming here to the microphone uh, to ask uh, via Zoom. It is of course possible to write in the chat or. If uh, if there are no questions, and I'm looking also at the at the chat, there is only one comment that was not. But yes, uh, there is a question from uh, Yoko Arisaka. Uh, can you? Hello. Um, Hi. Thank you very much for your interesting observation. Um, my question has to do with um, uh, recent attempts in the academia for decolonization, and um, the framework has been somewhat shifted to the north-south discourse and yeah. challenges from the south against um, these uh, hegemony of the the discourse of the north. And in this kind of new um, paradigm, if you will, would you think that that is still kind of a disguised um, West and the rest that is detectable, would you say? Or is it really changing so that um, these are the West and the rest is finally going to um, be overcome through these decolonizing efforts? I would just want to hear your view on it. Uh -huh. okay. Yes. It's very nice to see you, by the way, yes, nice after so many years. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, um, um, nice to see you. <laughs> too. Um, first of all, yes, the notion of the West, or even Europe, is over-determined. That is to say, there are many, many contexts in which the discourse of the West and, and, and the rest operates. For instance, in the 1960s, it is often said, Taiwan belongs to the West, while uh, the Eastern Germany did not uh, belong to the West. Uh, of course, in this case, the West uh, uh, implied the, the um, allied or the United States. And then the East, in this case, meant the basically uh, socialist bloc or second world. Or the West can mean, for instance, uh, North Atlantic alliance between the United States and Western Europe. And, but it very often uh, excluded Eastern Europe, um, uh, uh, because the, uh, as I mentioned about the area studies, uh, area studies did not include the West, but in fact, Slavic language and Russians were in fact uh, registered as, as, as a, a languages of areas. So there is area studies of uh, as, um, Slavic languages and Russians. So in this sense, the West is not unitary. And it is in this context, the opposition of uh, North and South is interesting because essentially North and South is a variation of the West and the rest in the sense that the North is supposed to be industrialized and 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 and, and advanced uh, uh, societies or group of societies versus the south uh, that is uh, underdeveloped and then uh, not industrialized 
uh, societies and so forth. And there are many other uh, markers according to which the West and the rest are differentiated. So the main point is that it is a discourse of the West and the rest. And the main point is that certain identification process for the West always requires a deliberate discrimination or objectification of the rest only in relation to the uh, non-West, the West can be identified as such. Therefore, there is a very, very tricky part in, uh, for instance, when uh, 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 Husserl discussed European humanity. He excluded from European humanity, for instance, gypsies who actually live in Europe, geographic Europe, but he didn't include gypsies because gypsies are not committed to theoretical attitude that characterizes uh, uh, European humanity. But if that is the criteria, uh, criterion, then vast majority of people living in Europe, so-called Europeans, are not Europeans. They are not committed to theoretical attitude at all. Only a very, very small uh, a number of elite intellectuals can afford to be committed to the mission of uh, European civilization. In other words, we talk about the West as a, a large civilization, but in fact, when it comes to the knowledge production by West, by the West, we mainly mean uh, some very exclusive elite formations. And in this sense, the, any person living in the States or uh, in um, Britain or uh, uh, France or Germany could be non-Westerner anytime. That is to say, it is this very uh, uh, division between, uh, in this case, the West and the rest or uh, uh, North and South itself is sustained by very precarious discriminatory system according to which uh, um, uh, one group of people are distinguished from the, uh, the other uh, group of people. And incidentally, the uh, notion of the West itself is historically very important uh, because without taking uh, into account the formation of Europe or later the West, it is in fact impossible to apprehend the racial category of white. Whiteness itself is a byproduct and it's a, I think, modern invention of the modern world. So in this sense, uh, I had to deal with multiple uh, context involved in the West and the rest, and also very over determination because it is simply impossible to determine the meaning of the West singularly. All right. Does it make sense? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the response, Professor. And uh, due to the fact that we are uh, very, very much uh, out of out of time, uh, I would like to ask you to to give just a very uh, brief answer to the question that was uh, that was posted in the chat by Lorenzo Marinucci. Uh, he asked uh, he would like to ask Professor Sakai if he, uh, if he thinks that there are still valuable insights in Watsuji's philosophy of Fudo, uh, despite the flaws. Uh, Professor uh, Sakai very convincingly described. Yes. Um, 
in, in a very ironical way. Because a uh, recent uh, phenomenon that can be observed in uh, Japan is hikikomori. Uh, it's usually called hikikomori, uh, a reclusive uh, a withdrawal. Some people uh, uh, refuse to uh, go out or stay in their bedrooms and then completely shut out from uh, social uh, uh, relations. Somewhat, I'm not saying um, the, the people who are called hikomori themselves, but the general phenomenon of hikomori uh, elsewhere I call the hikikomori nationalism uh, can be approached very much through uh, Watsuji's uh, analysis. Or in a sense, I understand Watsuji's cultural nationalism is a form of hikikomori nationalism uh, in that he is utterly impossible. He is incapable of dealing with foreigners. As a matter of fact, about two decades ago, I was invited to join a, a, a workshop. I forgot where it was. Uh, it might have been at Columbia University or somewhere in California. Uh, and in which a number of very uh, 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 famous scholars who worked on the, the works of uh, Watsuji Tetsuro uh, joined from Japan together with uh, some uh, area experts. And I'm sure uh, a few of them, few of the, the American area uh, experts who were present in the workshop are uh, present probably today among the audience. At that time, one of the, the uh, 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 Japanese scholars uh, who actually studied under the guidance of uh, Watsuji Tetsuro at Tokyo University said very interesting thing, which was uh, illuminatory. He said, Watsuji Tetsuro could not deal with white people. Well, he, he said in Japanese, Hakujin ga dame deshita. And this explains why, actually, as soon as he arrived in Berlin in 1927, uh, he decided to uh, go home. And I suspect some kind of mental uh, uh, breakdown occurred. And then uh, after his death, uh, the, his correspondence with his wife uh, was published as an as a anthology and its uh, title is Hokoku no Tsumae, and in which you can find some kind of uh, a crisis going on in uh, Watsuji's uh, uh, mind. And I think one of the characteristics of Watsuji's ethics, it's a, a huge part, is that implicitly he wrote the ethics in order to justify why he could not deal with foreigners. Watsuji could not deal with the strangers with whom there is an element of unpredictability, accident, and uncertainty. But if we do not accept unpredictability and uh, uh, uncertainty and accident, it is impossible to talk about social relations because 
in our relation to other, we constantly encounter unpredictability, uh, uncertainty, and accident. That is, there is no social relationship that is devoid of aleatory moment. That is, every social relation we have with other person is in itself is a wager. So in this sense, I think the, uh, we can learn some pathological aspect of uh, society from, I think, uh, uh, Watsuji uh, Tetsuro. And I'm not saying uh, Watsuji ethics would help uh, uh, the, the people who are called uh, hikikomori, rather, general phenomenon of uh, hikikomori nationalism, the exclusive rejection of foreigners, immigrants, and strangers can be analyzed in terms of uh, what it is uh, uh, work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, for your uh, great presentation again and uh, and for the answers. Uh, I'm sure we could uh, continue the discussion uh, much, much longer. I must, uh, I must uh, say, however, that uh, we have to continue with our next session. Uh, thank you very much again for being with us virtually and we really do hope that soon we can welcome you in Budapest uh, in, a, in a physical format. Thank you very much and thank you everyone for uh, mm. for joining the presentation. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, to the participants who are uh, who are present here in the room, uh, we are going to go uh, to another building, uh, Building R. Uh, but I will, of course, uh, come uh, with you. Uh, there are two rooms. One room uh, for the for the physical uh, session that is going to start, uh, that, yeah, uh, that is, uh, has started uh, at 4 uh, p.m. And there is another room uh, where you can follow uh, the online session uh, that also started uh, at, uh, at 4 p.m. Uh, here I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm just joining this, uh, this Zoom room with, uh, with the online session and, uh, and inform uh, the colleagues there that uh, we, we, we were in a little delay. Uh, and in the other room, uh, as I'm the chair there, uh, we are going to start uh, very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.